Good afternoon, my name is Kristen Spindler and I'm the Director of Incubator CTX at Concordia University, Texas. I'd like to welcome you today to our Leadership Lunch series. Today, our topic is crisis leadership and we have with us Major General Ken Wissian. We're grateful to partner with Ken today to bring you this Leadership Lunch seminar. Um, Major General Wissian is retired from the US Air Force where he led military disaster response efforts for multiple hurricanes and also for the Space Shuttle Columbia crash. He's currently the Executive Director of the Disaster Research Program Center for Space Research at the Cockrell School of Engineering at UT Austin. Ken has his PhD in Geophysics from SMU, his MS in Strategic Studies from the US Army War College, his MS in Geology from Centenary College and his bachelor's in physics from UT Austin. The format for today is going to be about 45 minutes as Ken takes us through his presentation. We'll leave 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. If you're new to Zoom, you've got a chat screen at the bottom of your um, computer and you can type in a question there um, or in the Q&A. We have um, a few of us here on the call monitoring the chat. So we'll be sure to get your questions and hopefully we'll have time for all of them. Um, if we don't, we'll certainly uh, log those questions and we can get back to you after the call. Um, so thanks so much, Ken, for sharing your expertise with us today. And with that, I'll let you go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Kristen. Hello, everyone. I'm gonna start going way back in history. So, the setting is 401 BC or BCE. The Greeks are the best heavy infantry in the world. And therefore they've been, uh, 10,000 of them have been recruited by one of the claimants to the Persian empire throne, Cyrus the Younger, to fight in a dynastic war for kingship and control of the Persian empire, which is the largest one in the world at this time. So 10,000 Greeks journey to what is today uh, Iran and Iraq. But Cyrus is killed almost right off the bat in the first big battle and his army falls apart, all except for the Greeks who stand their ground. The other Persian side is unable to, to uh, defeat them, so they invite them for some uh, peace talks. But when the Greeks leadership shows up for the peace talks, they're captured and executed, leaving these 10,000 Greeks uh, leaderless. So in finest form, they hold a mass meeting and elect new leaders, the senior of which is Xenophon. And Xenophon documents the subsequent months uh, that follow in one of the earliest works of military history called the Anabasis. Over the next few months, the Greeks fight their way back to their homeland through multiple hostile tribes, uh, very difficult terrain, all the while being dogged by the Persian army. And in these circumstances, these, this sustained crisis, Xenophon emerges as a really strong leader. His leadership ranges from cajoling his men into action to frequently leading the charge into the enemy's uh, lines himself. He proves inspirational. He is an adroit diplomat and ends up being surprisingly innovative in both military strategy and tactics. And so the whole book ends up documenting the emergence of a great leader in a crisis situation. So, you know, why am I diving back almost 2,500 years? Well, I think that span of time, when you look at it, and this is one of the earliest detailed military histories or leadership studies there is, over that span, which is about as long as you can get in recorded history, what you see is that leadership doesn't change. Technology, yes, culture even changes, but the fundamentals of good leadership are unchanging over the whole course of written human history. And I think that's an important point to keep in mind going forward. There is an immense amount of material that's published on leadership every year some of it good, some of it bad, but you need to keep that perspective of the timelessness of good leadership. So my talk is titled, Don't Panic. You'll see why in a little bit if, if, 
uh, you haven't caught the obscure reference of that already. A few fundamental points I want to go over before we really get into this. And that's kind of my assumptions that I start with. And the first of those is that leadership is learned, including crisis leadership, because it's just a sub part of leadership where you have compressed time and high stakes. But it's learned. Anybody can develop into a good leader. I myself am a highly introverted nerd and have learned to function under most circumstances as a decent leader. I don't believe there's such a thing as a born leader. If you look carefully at people who are referred to in that way, what you see is some episodes early in their life that shape their leadership ability. Yes, you can have different personalities, which may or may not fit the role or the image of a, a leader, but really it all comes down to leadership and how you grow up, how you're trained and such. Furthermore, unfortunately, most people get no training in leadership, uh, especially crisis leadership. Yes, if you're in the military, you get it quite a bit. If you've come out of a business school, maybe some, uh, probably a lot more on the management side, but the bottom line is that we find ourselves today in a new situation, a once in a, a generation or more worldwide crisis that takes almost anyone out of their comfort zone. So it's uh, not surprising at all to feel a little bit off balance, especially if you're young or new to leadership positions, which is what this is targeted at. None of it is rocket science. It's mostly common sense. In fact, some of you, I apologize if I undershoot your knowledge level, uh, but none of this is rocket science. I can say that because I know rocket scientists, but it's fairly common sense. But I hope that even someone who has a long experience and is confident in the leadership will still pick up something. I myself continue to learn new things about leadership all the time. But if you stick to it, and work on the basics. I think you'll surprise yourself at, at what you can accomplish under these circumstances. So now from going 2,500 years in the past, I'm gonna take you forward to the present for something a little bit different. In this, I want you to pay attention to the communication, the leadership handoff, motivation, reassurance, the accepting and uh, giving of responsibility and such. What? I'm talking to you. I got it. What are you, what? I'm looking at the new bed and then I'm looking at my baby and, and I can eat the little bit. A jelly in your bed? Yeah. Oh, look at you. Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I want my bean too. So, I yeah. want my bean too, Eli. Eli, do what I do. I, Eli, Eli, can you get this to like it out? Yep. Okay. Can I go to your bed? Thank you, Eli. Did you help? I um, no, I got the little. I think so I did, <laughs> so I did it by myself. Just... Oh, I forgot my binky. <laughs> God, they're I got my binky in my, I got my binky. But that's not blinky, that's pity. Okay, besides being adorably cute, what's the point of that? Well, the point is there, are, there is leadership all around you every day, day in, day out, and it's always a learning opportunity. You know, in that case, you see, again, 
real good communication, including closing the loop. You see a SWOT analysis. What are the resources at hand? What, uh, what do I need from others? Again, we're bridging the whole, the whole span of human history here and taking a look at situations where you can learn leadership. So what is this seminar? This is a very, very brief triage. My intent here is to start you on a path of building your own framework for leadership, which in turn builds your confidence. The seminar flow is a discussion on leadership principles. And again, due to time, this is not a comprehensive deal. This is the things that I've found most important in my practice. And then we'll look at leadership from a time sequence perspective, going from preparation through response, which is the actual crisis, recovery, and review. And note that, you know, I'll spend relatively little time on how do you make decisions in a crisis. And the reason why is that so much of it is about the preparation beforehand. And good preparation for a crisis makes things orders of magnitude better. And then a final warning, just on my style, I have a lot of most important points in here. So, hey, just bear with it. Okay, a little bit about me to start off here. So, you know, why listen to me? Well, I'm coming at this as an experienced practitioner. I've led organizations, big and small, up into the uh, thousands of people, military and civilian, uh, in peacetime wars and major disasters. Besides flying in three wars, I'm also a graduate of the Air Force Test Pilot School and have uh, quite a few test flights of uh, classified as high risk, which is an interesting experience in itself. On the state government side, I've also been responsible in the past for disaster recovery for the state of Texas, including budgetary authority in the billions of dollars. But, and now here's one of the most important points right off the bat, don't just listen to me. I'm just one perspective, and I do not believe there is one way. I don't like people who say, no, you follow my rules, you'll be good, that kind of thing. It's about building up your own perspective on leadership. And to do that, you need as many perspectives, other perspectives as you can get, which you can then distill into your own. Also, I'm an academic, but not in this field. I'm a geophysicist by training. I'm a practitioner is my perspective on leadership. And furthermore, again, as I stated, I'm an introverted nerd. What worked for me as a leader would not work, at least not some of it, for someone who has a very different personality. So again, it's that one size does not fit all when you're talking about leadership and crisis leadership in particular. A few word on terms. I use crisis uh, interchangeably with emergency and disaster. Perhaps the more uh, important difference is leadership versus management, which is always an issue. I look at it pretty simply. Leadership is the motivation of people. Management is that larger picture of how you run an organization, which includes leadership, but is much more expansive than that. And then the principles. Principles are those guide stars that help you figure out what's the right thing to do in any situation. So for those that didn't get this earlier, Don't Panic is from, at least in my use, from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, a great 80s science fiction book, radio series, and television series. Uh, quite funny. But anyway, the point is that Don't Panic is obviously easier said than done. But that practice, that building your own leadership, that confidence that I've talked about, and a lot more about the preparation that we'll get into can make a huge difference on your ability to stay calm. That's where the military comes in, training, training, training. The military spends 90, 95% of its time training for combat so that when you actually get in the situation, you're not having to think about every individual action, you're reacting off your training and you have more confidence. 
you need to stay calm, especially if you're in a formal leadership position, because people cue off their leaders at any level, whether you're a leader of a two-person group or thousands, people cue off you. And panic and despair are contagious, extremely contagious, and can spread like wildfire through an organization. Armies don't get routed because they're beaten. They get routed because one small part thinks they're beaten, and then the fear spreads through the entire ranks. Same thing can happen in any city, setting, from a business to a government entity. Now, in getting to principles, the foundation of these is your core values. They underlie everything else. They're kind of your, your cornerstone that you build upon. And your core principles it should be succinct and they should be reflexive. You should be able to just spit them out at, any, at a moment's notice. And although I can rant for hours, maybe days, on what's wrong with the military and particularly what's wrong with the Air Force, one thing that I think they got right were the core values of integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all we do. I had them on my challenge coin as a two-star general, which you can see in the bottom, the first words of integrity, service, and excellence as a way of conveying, conveying to folks how much I take them to heart. And I've carried them through uh, into my civilian life. I see no need to change those. They've worked perfectly for me. Whatever yours are, I urge you to, to examine what they are, make sure they fit with your organization or else you might be in the wrong organization and uh, find what works for you in this case. I've got many case studies throughout here, but we'll only do a few of them. We might come back to some if questions steer me to them. So I'm gonna move on to those leadership principles. So building upon the core values, you build upon leadership. And you know, I think it's the law somewhere that every general in April has to have their own leadership presentation and sets of principles and all. I've got mine. If you want to find someone else's, I recommend Googling uh, Colin Powell's leadership presentation. It's readily available on the internet. Uh, but anyway, on mine, they're usually in threes and I'm no different. My first one is take care of people and get the mission done. Now what is different is I place those on one line, two separate tasks. And that's because I firmly believe that you have to keep them in balance or else your organization will fail. In the military, there's a particular common problem of putting mission over people and burning up the people. And unfortunately, military leaders can frequently get away with that because the turnover, you don't stay in command for very long and you can burn up a unit and be gone before the consequences come home to roost. But the long-term success of any organization depends on keeping those two in balance. So during a surge or a long running crisis, yeah, no one gets leave or vacation till it's over. But when it's over, you balance that out by giving people more downtime, not just a monetary reward, because that doesn't recharge your psyche, at least not for most people. That downtime, I believe, is critical. In the midst of a crisis where you're working through the night, it might be something as small as, you know, observing your people and saying, uh, hey, Jane, go, go back to your desk and put your head down for 30 minutes and recharge. You know, it's those things where you're constantly at different time scales looking to keep these two things in balance. And during a crisis, it's easy to get out of balance and burn out uh, amazingly rapidly. The next one is be safe. Even in combat, there are safety standards. And especially in a pandemic, it's, it's critical. Now, even, you know, if you're a, uh, doing close air support of a ground unit. So you're dropping bombs in support of friendly forces on the ground. There are still safety standards of how close you can aim to drop a bomb to your friendly forces. Closer than that is what's called danger close and it requires a, a special authorizations to do that. So there are standards. They change depending on the situations and the mission needs, but there are still standards. Back to the pandemic though, underlying almost anything else is still the leader's responsibility for safety of their people. So in these situations where we find ourselves in today, if you're asking people to come into work, it is a, an obligation and a responsibility that cannot be handed off or shirked to provide for your people's safety. 
absolutely fundamental and no compromise allowed on that. So if you're asking people to do something, you've got to provide them with the best safety possible. And then the last thing, the third thing is have fun. I particularly enjoy telling this to audiences as a, uh, as a general, because usually you can see the jaws drop open at that. What? He's telling us to have fun, but yes. You know, if you don't look forward to coming into work most days, maybe not every single day, but most days, something's wrong and you need to do something about it. In the midst of a crisis, one moment of levity can do a wonders for refocusing everybody, resetting the equilibrium, and uh, getting productivity up. So, leading by example, that's probably the most common cited classification, trait, category, whatever you want to call it, in everybody's list of qualities in leadership. Leading by example. As a leader, you are watched constantly at all levels. Again, even if you're in charge of two people or if you're a parent, your leadership is watched continually. Part of the, a key part of that is your honesty. You are human. Don't pretend that you're not. Uh, it goes back to that inconsistency and credibility. It's vitally important that you own your mistakes and uh, stomp, stomp, those of your subordinates. I have never in my entire career gotten in trouble for owning up to a mistake, uh, as long as you don't repeat mistakes. And taking ownership of your subordinates is also important. Remember uh, Harry Truman's motto on his desk, the buck stops here. You as a leader have the responsibility for everything that happens under you. Whether you're aware of it or not, it's your responsibility. The flip side of that is you pass credit on. You're not in a position as a leader to take credit for the success of your organization. You should be passing that on to the people that did the work. Doing these things builds your credit for those hard times. It builds your leadership credit so that you can draw on that when you really need it and when the crunch time comes. And I will go into this case study a little bit. This is one of my favorites. And a great example of that credit and leadership by, by, uh, by example, along with things like communication and such. No one case study is tightly focused on one aspect of leadership. They always come together in multiple aspects, but I'll emphasize one typically when I look at a case. So the setting is 9 the morning of 9-11 at the Washington DC Air National Guard. It's an F-16, it's a fighter unit uh, in training status. They don't have any alert aircraft, uh, their, their job is just to train and practice for war, like I said. The unit commander is Mark Sassable, very experienced fighter pilot, combat veteran. The newest member of the unit is Lieutenant Heather, nicknamed Lucky Penny. She's fresh out of F-16 training, new in the unit, getting her what's called local upgrade training. So she's there for training, along with about a half dozen other pilots, are there for a routine day of training flights and practicing. Well, one aircraft hits the World Trade Center and it gets everybody's attention. A second aircraft hits, okay, they know something's up, shortly followed shortly after by one hitting the Pentagon. Okay, clearly we're under attack. The word comes down, get up in the air, get those aircraft going and stop the unknown fourth aircraft at that time. At that point, Mark Sassable sticks his head into the pilot ready room where the pilots are hanging out and says, Lucky, meaning Lieutenant uh, Penny, you're coming with me. They're gearing up in, their, in the pre-flight area, which, uh, the life support area, which is uh, getting your helmet ready, putting on your uh, G suit and such. And he looks at her and says, I'm going for the cockpit. She replied without hesitating, I'll take the tail. It was a plan and a pack. Let's go, he said. Penny had never scrambled a jet before. Normally the pre-flight's a half hour or so of methodical checks. She automatically started going down the list. Lucky, what are you doing? Get your butt up there, let's go, Sassabelle shouted. She climbed in, rushed to power up the engines, screamed for a ground crew to pull the chocks. The crew chief still had his headphones plugged into the fuselage as she nudged the throttle forward. He ran alongside pulling safety pins from the jet as it moved forward. 
She muttered to herself the fighter pilot's prayer. God, don't let me F this up, and followed Sassanel into the sky. Now, I want you to think back on that. Sassaville came in and said six words. I'm going for the cockpit. She replied with four words. I'll take the tail. Ten words total have conveyed a mountain of information and shown great leadership and followership. Now, bear in mind, if you're, if you're not familiar with what they're saying here, it's, they've got no armed aircraft. It would take about an hour to get aircraft armed, and they're tr rushing to do it, but they've got to get up in the air. So the commander has come in, grabbed the youngest person, so you've got the most experienced and least experienced person in the unit, are going to go up and ram an airliner with their own aircraft to bring it down. You can't do that in six words unless you've got a lot of leadership credibility. Extra zinger. Lieutenant Penny's father was a pilot for the airline and flew the route that the missing aircraft was on. She didn't know if she was going up to uh, take out her father's aircraft or not. Now, it turned out that the people, the passengers on the plane, stopped the hijacking at the cost of their own life. But still an outstanding example of leadership that's just, you know, day in, day out. Bringing it closer to home, about a little over a month ago, I was picking up my first uh, curbside grocery order under the lockdowns. I drove out to the Randalls on uh, North FM 620 here in Austin and pulled up into the parking spot, called the number on the sign, and uh, a woman standing in the parking lot next to me answered it, said, yep, I'm, I'm here. What's your name? I'll go get your groceries. She brought out the groceries, loaded them in the back of the car. We chatted and exchanged some, some pleasantries through, through mass. And then she wished me a good day and, and uh, closed the trunk and left. Now, what I observed in this exchange was one, she was a little bit younger than me, but I'm no spring chicken. What are grocery stores filled with as far as their workforce goes? A lot of very young people. It would have been very easy for the leadership of that grocery store to look at the youngest person and say, you, you go do that. That's the most dangerous job in the grocery store right now is interacting with the public. She was a, she was a departmental manager. I'm quite confident that something happened to the line lines of, well, we've got to set up this curbside delivery. I'll take the first shift without saying this part, but leading by example. And that, that's just an outstanding example of, of doing what needs to be done and setting the example close to home, day in, day out, here in Austin. I hope most of you have seen at some point or another the HBO miniseries Band of Brothers. That is, I think, the best uh, visual study of leadership development, growth, and so on uh, that's been done in quite a long time. And I won't go into uh, this study much, but there are just scores of well-done studies in leadership in that. One of the ones that comes out to me a lot is delegation. Particularly, you know, if you're in a startup or a small business, uh, a lot of people are used to doing everything themselves. But delegation is critical. And in a leadership position during a crisis, you will be task saturated. You will not have any spare bandwidth. It's vitally important that you delegate appropriately. One, so that you can preserve your own uh, bandwidth and sanity, but two, it's an outstanding opportunity for people's growth. And even in combat, there's, uh, this is practiced. But at the same time, you can't delegate responsibility without making sure you delegate the authority and the independence too or else you actually end up uh, negative teaching. You should always be training your replacement because an organization that fails because you're not there is not a well-planned or set up organization. It's obviously part of the military because you never know what might take you out of the picture, but it should be a part of any organization, government, business, whatever. And it's also a great opportunity to watch for those emergent leaders, those people who you know, under the crisis really start to shine. And I know that's how I 
uh, spotted the person that that uh, I gave uh, the opportunity to succeed me in command of the Texas Air National Guard was spotting her reactions during Hurricane Katrina response that just impressed the heck out of me. And I said, that person has it. Communication. This is a huge field and it's one of those large areas that gets published on every year. All I want to tell you is to be yourself. You're not that good an actor, I can assure you, and insincerity again cripples you as a leader. You should play to your strengths. I'm not a big fan of this work on your weaknesses uh, approach to leadership or communication in general. Play to your strengths. Again, myself as an introvert, I work best in small groups, talking informally. Yes, I can talk to a large group. I've given many public uh, speeches, but I'm most comfortable when I'm talking in small groups. Don't forget that communication is a two-way street. This can be easily lost during a crisis when it's give out a quick PA or an email blast to everyone in the organization saying, do this, or do that. If you aren't watching to assess how the message received is received, you have not closed the loop on communication. And part, another part of that is having that feedback mechanism back up to you as a leader on how, it, how are things going? What is the, the pulse of the unit? I was super fortunate when I was a wing commander in the Air Force to have an outstanding command chief. A command chief is that senior sergeant, the senior enlisted person in your organization, and they're on your personal staff. Mine was uh, Command Chief Master Sergeant Priscilla Leger. And she had an excellent knack for coming into my office periodically because I'm quite comfortable just homesteading behind my desk and grabbing me and said, sir, come with me. I go, yes, ma'am, where are we going? We're gonna go visit Unit X. They need a little TLC from me. And we go visit a unit. I'd sit down and talk with them in small groups. And it did wonders for everyone involved. It connected me back with the unit, allowed me to directly assess what's going on and what the, the temperature of the unit was. And when I couldn't do that, she was always my, uh, my thermometer for, the, for how the unit's doing. All those are important resources. Communication as a leader, I think is best when it's brief. What's the most famous speech in American history? And it's the Gettysburg Address minutes long. The headline speaker on that day spoke for hours. No one remembers them. Lincoln spoke for a few minutes and gave one of the masterpieces of American history. One of the other great English language communicators is Winston Churchill. I'm going to play you a short snippet of a short speech that he gave. It was his first speech to the house, to, to the British Empire, really, after he took over the prime ministership, prime ministership right at the beginning of World War II. So Britain was on its heels and in a deep hole uh, almost by itself in fighting Germany. Listen for how he communicates and what he communicates. The realistic set assessment, the statement of policy and goals, his commitment, his explanation of why it's important and his call for unity. And I'm going to fast forward to the meat of it, just about two minutes in. I received His Majesty's commission to form a new administration with which it has been necessary to act. I would say to the House, as I said to those who have joined the government, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many, many long months of struggle and of suffering. You ask what is our policy? I will say it is to wage war by sea, land and air, with all our might and with all the strength that God can give us. To wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark and lamentable catalogue of human crime. That is our policy. You ask. What is our aim? I can answer in one word, victory. Victory at all costs. 
Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. For without victory there is no survival. Let that be realized. No survival for the British Empire. No survival for all that the British Empire had stood for. No survival for the urge and impulse of the ages that mankind will move forward towards its goal. But I take up my task with buoyancy and hope. I feel sure that our cause will not be suffered to fail among men. At this time, I feel entitled to claim the aidable. And I say, come then, let us go forward together with our united strength. Real masterpiece of concise communication and leadership. The last principle I want to hit on is to never stop learning. Keep your eyes and ears open. I hope I've illustrated that the opportunity to learn and study leadership is all around you all the time and going all the way back in history. Study in a way that works for you. I'm a reader, so I do a lot of that. But there's a lot of good and a whole lot of bad leadership examples in movies. I know uh, people are often surprised at uh, what an action, how I behave as having been a general compared to what they see in the movies. You can learn as much from bad leaders as well as good. It's, you know, I had multiple uh, not so good leaders early in my Air Force career and some of the lessons I took away was, well, if I'm ever in charge, I'm not gonna do it that way. That's still a valuable lesson. And don't forget about your peer group. Peer groups are an awesome resource. When you're having a problem, ask your, your, your peers, hey, has anyone ever dealt with this? You'd be surprised how much experience there is in a peer group of even relatively junior folks. And then the last thing is find a mentor or a hero, preferably real, but fictional works too, that you want to emulate or get advice from or be mentored by. So crisis phases, we'll go through this relatively quickly. I look at it this way as a, as a uh, circle of response, bearing in mind that you can jump from, jump from any one to the other this is just the nominal flow. Preparation to response, which is the actual crisis. Recovery and review, or frequently it's called mitigation. Bear in mind though, that a lot of times what you have is multiple cycles of this at different stages running in parallel. So say you have a major hurricane event, for instance, which I've dealt with a lot. You may be in the response recovery phase from the flooding from a hurricane while Bear in mind, disasters are always compound. So if you have a flood, you typically have fires because gas lines and electrical lines break, or you have uh, oil spills or other things. So one disaster is never a disaster by itself. So you may be in the recovery phase for flooding. You may be still responding to fires, and they're in the preparation phase for a possible uh, disease outbreak following the shutdown of the uh, water purification systems. So it's a general guide or framework to think about it, but you have to bear in mind that the actual situations are always a very complex mixture. Within those phases, I think the preparation is the most important point, the planning. And I wanna lead that off with two key phrases that really sum it up well. No plan survives contact with the enemy and plans are worthless, but planning is everything. Now, how do you reconcile this? Well, plans are done in advance. They generally are not flexible. And situations change. When you're fighting an enemy, they're actively trying to defeat your, your plans with as much brain power as you've got. So you can't let a plan be a straitjacket. On the other hand, planning is how you think through all the options all the resources what your teams are and such and it's absolutely invaluable from that perspective and that's why eisenhower was so big on it. in fact he taught planning uh, to the u.s military for a long time you know it involves things like building your teams your functional teams for a crisis it involves communicating you know if you're if your small business is uh, might be flooded in say three hours because the river's rising 
who do you need to bring in to save your essential information or back it up? And how do you communicate that to them? I know in a lot of disasters, the first thing to go is the phone and internet service. Is your, do you have your backup plan for how, do you have everyone's address? Do you have a plan for a runner to go to everybody physically and communicate what needs to be done? And what are your pre-planned trigger points for that? The point being that the less you have to, have to figure out in the moment, the better off you are. And it's, again, this is one of those order of magnitude things. If you're having to create everything on the fly in the crisis, you're gonna be at best 10% effective compared to what you would be if you've done good planning. An example of how to apply this that I like, and this is a hypothetical, but say you're a single parent with three kids, age five, 10, and 15, and it's a day like today, severe weather. Okay, there's a tornado watch issue. What does that mean? Well, it means a tornado might form. Okay, your reaction is at that point is probably just monitoring the weather a little more closely. A little while later, a tornado warning comes out and it says that there's a tornado that might be heading your direction. Okay, now you've reached a clear trigger point. What do you do? Well, as a single parent, you need to stay in overview mode and be running the whole situation. I might, for instance, assign my 15-year-old, the oldest, to watch in the direction that the, that the tornado might come from. The five and 10-year-olds, I might instruct to, hey, go gather all the pillows you can and start building a fort in the bathroom. And maybe I'll help them bring in a mattress or two. And that's a day-to-day -day example of how as a, a parent, you're a leader and how you can do work through these same things of planning, teamwork, communicating and such. And then a sub part of this is gaming. Now, again, I already warned you, I'm a nerd. I grew up playing Dungeons and Dragons. Really set me up well for doing military gaming and war, war gaming and planning. And that you get used to working and keeping track of fairly complex situations in your head and working through them. Gaming, along with planning, has a tremendous return on investment to an organization. And it can be at any level of sophistication. It can be as simple as sitting around the, a, a small leadership team, sitting around a table and verbally what ifing different scenarios. It can go all the way up to something like I've been in multiple times, which is red flag, which is kind of like Top Gun with a little bit of steroids thrown in. A multi-day, 100 aircraft war game that exercises every skill you've got and an incredible amount of options. Having gone through red flag multiple times, I felt that actual flying and combat was relatively simple. It's those kinds of things where you've, again, built up your own confidence, you've practiced, you've what if prior to getting in the actual situation. And here's where it starts to all come together. In a crisis, you're gonna fall back and react on instincts. What you don't want that to be is untrained instincts. You, when you're falling back on your muscle memory, so to speak, you want it to be on your first principles that you've thought through and on your training that has developed your instincts in the right way. This sign from uh, 1939 Britain, just prior to the war starting, I really think is a great one. You see it nowadays in all kinds of variations, but it's so timeless on what it's doing. Keep calm and carry on. It's telling you motivation. It's telling you what your job is, how to do it and such. In all this though, obviously in a crisis, most things are a lot harder. But there is one thing that is actually easier, I believe, than in day-to-day -day work, and that is team cohesion. In a crisis, people have a strong tendency to coalesce and form really good, effective teams. Why? Because the need is clear. Everybody understands, generally, the crisis and what the goal is. But if you aren't following those good leadership principles, you can destroy this, you can destroy team cohesion in a heartbeat. Again, that's where you wanna be, when you're reacting, you're reacting on the right instincts and training. Along with that being forced onto your instincts, one of the things that, you, that it comes as a surprise to a lot of people in their first crises or so, is that you have to make decisions with grossly incomplete information. You just have to accept that. 
because of the time constraint, you will never have all the information you want in making the decision. If you're a perfectionist, you're in real danger here. A perfectionist needs to have someone standing right beside them that will tell, tell them when it, hey, Ken, you got to make a decision now. Because perfection is the enemy of good enough in an emergency. I'm going to skip over the freeze the build. Back to that time. You know, one thing is information. That's limited because of time. And then the other thing is the actual time. Time is such a valuable commodity in a crisis. And as a leader, you have to really watch your bandwidth. There will be more demands on your time than there is time available. So what do you have to do? You have to prioritize. You have to be making, focusing your time on the right decisions that need to be made at your level. I tend to use uh, risk matrix thinking. And there's a very simple one here where you have more impact of a event and more probability, resulting in high impact, high probability events in the top right being red. As a leader, if you're not spending your time in the red and maybe a little bit of yellow, uh, something's wrong. If easy decisions are coming up to the top for a call, then your organization is not functioning well. The easy decisions should be made at the lowest level possible. So that time compression forces you into prioritizing what you spend your time on in a more extreme way than day to day. And because of that time compression, you really get into a lead follower, get out of the way situation. You, have, you will have to sometimes be abrupt with people. But, and I can't stress this enough, even if you have to be hard and abrupt with people, there's no need to be disrespectful at all. So you focus on the important time critical decisions and make sure that the hardest ones are coming up to the top. That's what you get paid the big bucks as a leader for. And the communication in the moment, I'm gonna speed this up a little bit so I don't run over too many people's lunch times. I apologize for that. Uh, again, back to the communication, it's about being succinct and closing the loop. That's the important part there. It's not just sending a message out, it's making sure that was received and understood. I could do a whole hour on a great video that's available. In fact, I have done a whole hour before on the leadership of a major combat engagement by the Air Force. Sometime maybe I can do that. It's a very instructive leadership example under where under these, this day and age where you see everything recorded, that you really can st study actual combat experience, leadership experience. And then uh, getting towards the end here, don't forget to take care of yourself as a leader. And that's whether you're a formal leader or an informal leader. I highly recommend, besides Band of Brothers, this classic movie from 1949 called 12 O'Clock High. It is an outstanding study in the burden of command and how that can wear a person down in fairly short order. You have to take care of yourself too. So besides watching your other people and saying, hey, go take a 30 minute nap, maybe you need to do it to yourself or have someone who will tell you that also. The recovery phase, not much detail here. On the government side, this, there's a, a lot of misapplication of this because recovery is a totally different environment than crisis response and takes a different leadership perspective and style. This I do want to hammer a little bit though. Okay, the crisis is over. Okay, everybody go back home, take a vacation, come back in a month. No, no. Critical that before it leaves, the, while it's still fresh in people's mind that you do your after action review so that you can do better next time. You have to be honest and brutal the flying world in the military has a very good tradition of debriefing after every mission, whether it's combat or training. And everyone involved gets in the one room together and walks through a mission and talks about what went right, what went wrong. And you don't pull your punches, although you do stay respectful. So I've seen many cases where a sergeant loadmaster or gunner is telling a lieutenant colonel pilot, hey, sir, uh, that run-in was not good. You know, you threw us against the wall without warning or whatever. Uh, it's vitally important that the egos get put aside and that you have that critique and then spec out what needs to be done or corrected in the future so that when the next crisis happens, you're ready. So with that, I'm gonna leave you with one last leadership example, not all good, not all bad, and then we'll take questions. Well done, boys. Looks like I scold sushi for breakfast.
We'll go out for pineapple, my little bobbly headed bobbly boo. Skipper, look. Analysis. It looks like a small incandescent bulb, designed to indicate something out of the ordinary, like a malfunction. I find it pretty and somewhat hypnotic. That too, sir. Right. Rico. Manual. Mm -hmm. Problemo solved. Sir, we may be out of fuel. What makes you think that? We've lost engine one. And engine two is no longer on fire. Buckle up, boys. Don't look dull. This might get hairy. Attention, this is your captain speaking. I've got good news and bad news. The good news is we'll be landing immediately. The bad news is we're crash landing. Okay. Let's take some questions. 